I'm Kevin Boyce. I'm a paleontologist. I'm specifically a paleobotanist. I work with the fossil record of plants to study the evolution of development and physiology in the fossil record. It's very easy to look at a fossil um, and think of it as a tombstone, um, as a marker of, of you know, something died in a particular place at a particular time. But it's not a tombstone. It's, it's an actual organism, and you can study it like an organism. Um, there's certain limitations. Um, they've been dead for a very long time, hundreds of millions of years. But um, you can work with that, and it's kind of a fun challenge. If you look at kind of pretty fossil wood from a rock shop that's all red and blue and yellow and stuff like that, that really is just a rock. But there is other fossil wood that is just black and, and doesn't, you know, it, it's kind of coaly, right? Um, and it does not get sold in rock shops in the same way, but that has all the original organic matter. It's all there. The whole plant is there. It's just been preserved in a rock. I split my time fairly evenly between living and fossil plants because you really need to understand what's going on in the living organisms, the living plants, to then understand what's going on in the fossil record. Then apply that back to look at the evolution of how they've functioned through time and how that's changed. Um, and those changes can have really, really large impacts because most of the biomass in the world is plants. And they are what determines the content of our atmosphere. They are what determines our climate and how hot and cold and wet and dry it is. Um, and what the hills and mountains look like and how deep the soil is. That, that all comes down to the evolution of plants. In the modern world, most of the world, most of everything you see out there, um, aside from ferns and conifers, are flowering plants. Flowering plants have been very good at altering their environments, but in a real sense what they're doing is they're buffering their environments. Um, they're making it cooler and they're making it wetter in the tropics. So if you disrupt that, um, um, it can have a very large impact. In their absence, it'll get hotter and it'll get drier. There will always be tropical rainy belts, but the question of an ever wet rainforest that is very much impacted by the vegetation itself that is um, forming that rainforest. I've always kind of thought of paleontology as being a pioneer, and there's plenty of fields of science where there's enough saturation where if you don't do it, it'll get done. Whereas in paleontology, I've always felt like if you don't do it, no one else will. <laughs> and I've, I've always liked that kind of homesteading aspect of it. You can go anywhere with it, and there's, there's plenty of things to do. I think the great kind of unachievable goal um, is always to be uncomfortable and kind of slightly terrified that um, you're trying something new, you're trying to learn a new technique, you're trying to master the literature of a different discipline with different perspectives and different math, and, and, and um, you're always feeling like you're kind of, you know, in over your head. But um, that's when you're most likely to make interesting connections. Um, and um, sometimes you genuinely in, are in or over your head and it goes nowhere. Um, and so there's a big pull not to take those risks of dead ends. Um, and I think what um, a MacArthur provides is the opportunity you know, uh, to take those risks and to remain comfortably uncomfortable.